Now to tell us about the fight for 15 is the guy who literally wrote the book about it, uh, David Rolf, uh, who is the president of SEIU 775 and the author of The Fight for 15 uh, and a catalyst in the fight uh, here in Seattle uh, to increase the minimum wage. Welcome, David. Thanks for having me, Eric. Um, so, uh, you know, this book, uh, which is uh, just out right now, describes uh, in so many ways how this movement emerged. And take us back really to the very beginning, um, not even in Seattle, but just yeah. how this movement uh, uh, was first birthed. Yeah. You know, I think we have to start by understanding Americans have faced a 40-year wage freeze and that work doesn't pay any more in this country, not because we're less productive, less educated, but because we made a set of bad policy choices that ended up lowering wages for the bottom 90% of income earning Americans over a generation. And in November of 2012, a group of fast food workers in Brooklyn, New York, only a couple hundred of them, had the courage to walk off their job at chains like McDonald's, KFC, Taco Bell, Wendy's, and not to protest something their employer specifically did or didn't do, but to protest the structure of an industry built on low-wage work. And at the same time, here in our area, workers in SeaTac were organizing, demanding 15 in a union in the subcontracted jobs at the airport that used to be living wage jobs a generation ago, but now are minimum wage jobs, cleaning planes, putting fuel in jets, handling baggage. And that then came together with a series of echo strikes around the country rolling through the Midwest in the spring of 2013 until on May 29th uh, in the evening uh, in Ballard, a woman named Carolyn DeRocher walked off the job at her Taco Bell, brought her two co-workers with her, shut down the restaurant, and that became then the spark that launched the following day thousands of workers in Seattle going on strike, marching through the street, and demanding 15 in a union. You know, that, that contagion of direct action and protest uh, was happening in part before and in part parallel with uh, a larger strategic uh, and political effort on your part uh, to coordinate some of these activities and to think, wow, there's this energy here. How do we focus this and direct this toward uh, a policy agenda change and, and describe that kind of parallel effort? To well, clearly the fight for 15 has captured the imagination of Americans and it did so almost from its first moment. Uh, the first day of national strikes in August of 2013, the New York Times wrote that the uh, civil rights marchers had it right 50 years ago and the fast food strikers have it right today. Because there's something going on in this country where Americans are just sick of waiting for Congress or CEOs to do the right thing and they're ready to make work pay again. Uh, but, but once you have that kind of expression of, you know, we're mad as hell, we're not gonna take it anymore and it's either walking off the job or organizing strikes or organizing marches in the streets, uh, that conversion uh, uh, from protest to durable political and policy change uh, uh, re required a bit of architecting. I wouldn't say control because it's a, you know, it was a very uh, you complicated if thing. You, if you call a strike and no one shows up, you don't really have much power. Yeah, so here in Seattle, for instance, kind of walk us through that Sure, there were two of, things happening at once. One was the, those airport workers who'd been organizing for three years down at SeaTac decided they, they, they were, again, sick of waiting for Alaska Airlines or the Port of Seattle to do the right thing, and they qualified a ballot measure to raise their minimum wage to $15 along with paid sick leave and other provisions. And then the fast food strikers here in Seattle um, really used the, uh, the timing of the city municipal elections to make this demand on City Hall, right, and to ask the mayoral candidates to come and debate low-wage worker issues and tell the public how they would live on a $9.18 budget themselves if they had to. And uh, this became a giant issue in the municipal elections, both in SeaTac and in Seattle. And I think what we didn't see coming is that it became a national issue, mm -hmm. that we had BBC and uh, camera crews and NewsHour camera crews in SeaTac covering those workers' efforts. And it really became a, a huge story in the, those national elections. Well, it's fascinating when you compare SeaTac uh, and Seattle, these two different modes, one in SeaTac of citizens organizing to get a me measure on the ballot, yep. um, and in Seattle, citizens organizing to pressure elected representatives on their council uh, and mayoral candidates to uh, change mm -hmm. uh, policy. In both cases, though, I want to rewind half a step. Sure. 15, yep. right? 15 itself was a a choice to define the fight a certain way. It wasn't simply saying we want higher wages or right. this wage is too low. That's right. um, how did the crystallization of defining the fight around 15 occur? You know, we could say there's a, there's a precise science behind 15, <laughs> but the reality is it was a bold 
uh, aspirational, morally compelling demand that inspired people to walk off the job, right? Just like we didn't fight for the 8.15 hour day or the 7.92 hour day, we were fighting for 15. And that was, uh, you know, here's the thing. For too long, we've had a debate where the Republicans want to do no minimum wage increases, and the Democrats offered a nickel here and a dime there. Well, a nickel and a dime doesn't really solve anyone's problems. It doesn't make, mean you can afford the rent. It doesn't mean you can certainly replace your broken dryer or, you know, pay off your credit card debt or uh, fix the, reeking, the leaking roof. But 15 was actually inspiring because it was going to change people's lives. Now, and that's what really made it a catalyst. Part of the story that you tell in this book, The Fight for 15, um, is about an experience we share together. Yeah. And for full disclosure, we both served uh, on the task force yeah. that the mayor of Seattle created uh, to get this city to a $15 minimum wage. Um, and within that task force, there were a whole range of interests from big business to small business, labor, mm -hmm. immigrant rights, uh, yeah. you know, everyday citizens. Um, within that context of that fight, um, this is the last question I want to pose to you. How did you frame things in order to uh, craft a compromise that could get us to yeah. uh, 15? And then how did you sell that compromise as a victory rather than, oh, it takes too long or it's got too many exemptions or what have you? Yeah. You know, in the book, I talk about the different pieces of the strategy in Seattle. And one of them was street heat and worker protest. One of them was having a smart strategy around the elections. Another was the mayor who did, a, I think, a really terrific job of walking the right path and saying, we are going to get to 15, that we're not going to debate whether workers need a raise, but we want stakeholders to come together and figure out how. And then we also had, of course, forces both on the right and the left pulling to try to influence that commission and later city council. So, you know, I think what we said from the beginning, Howard Wright, my co-chair, and I said, listen, we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And... Um, we've got to figure out how to make this happen. Because I think, the, to give credit to the business community, they saw what happened in SeaTac, where the wage went up to 15 on seven weeks' notice. And they said, well, we'd rather negotiate than we would fight. And I think that was a really a testament to the good leadership, not only of the mayor, but of some people in the Seattle business community. And it helped very much to have 15 Now and Socialist Alternative pulling us leftward and having forces out there that were threatening ballot measures because that created some strong incentives for people to actually come together and make a deal. Well, it is just a compelling and still living case study on how to convert the energy of protest into durable uh, political and policy change. And David, thank you both for uh, your work in making it happen and you're telling the story of it in this book, uh, The Fight for 15. Thanks so much, Eric. All right, great to have you.